Kit Sank here, and um, I think I have a new model that might outlay or at least give us an idea of, of um, how the solar system works and why it moves in a precession. And also it's going to give a little credence to the idea that we are, uh, we, we are in a binary star system and that binary star is influencing not only our planet but the entire solar system which um, will explain a whole host of things when it comes to um, the pole shift, the uh, weather that we're seeing, the, the cataclysms that have been uh, documented uh, in history, um, why you know, mass extinctions like uh, dinosaurs happen, you know, um, on intervals and uh, why cataclysms happen on intervals. So my theory is this, um, this right here, the, this is the first figure. Um, this is the binary angular momentum counter force required to balance the solar system in processional movement. So basically what I'm saying is that the sun is moving along and behind the sun are our planets that are spinning to follow the sun. Okay, I don't want to use the word gravity because I don't like it. I think that there's a better word to use and um, if I were to use the word gravity, it's going to, I think, lead to some incorrect conclusions. Um, I would rather redefine it and look at it more like static force but this can be understood through the lens of gravitational forces so basically the sun the planets are attracted to the sun because they're uh, gravitationally uh, attracted to the sun objects in motion have a tendency to stay in motion and um, so the Sun is basically moving along with its own momentum and the gravitationally attracted planets are following the Sun and spinning around it like so so like typically when you look at a diagram of the solar system you're kind of looking at, at it from top down where the Sun is in the center and the planets ring out from that but in reality because we know that the um, planets are, are distant from the Sun, um, like one AU would be one astronomical unit, that's one distance between the Earth and the Sun, so you know that they follow in lines behind the Sun, and they have that spin. Now, my theory is that there is a binary twin to the sun, which is a brown dwarf star, which is which is a a, a dense, uh, failed. Uh, I wouldn't call it. Well, I guess it's a failed star. It's just burned out. Um, it, it wants energy. It's hungry for energy. It's um, probably at least six times the mass of Jupiter because it's got its own planetary bodies that follow it. And this is what um, the Bible would call wormwood. It's also called Nemesis. Um, so I actually call the brown dwarf Nemesis. The entire system is the Nemesis system. And inside the planetary bodies are like uh, Ferrata, Helion, Nibiru, um, that what, 36,000 mile wide um, planet that's kind of in two chunks. You always think of a uh, planet being a, a singular kind of a round thing. This thing's broken, all right? Well, the brown dwarf has got its own angle of momentum, and so do its planetary bodies. So it's going to get to the point, the same, same way that they slingshot rockets and satellites around the moon, the moon uh, or uh, a large enough body is going to gravitationally attract that force, and then it's going to reach its apogee and then it's the it's get the gravitational force is going to repel it 
and it's gone. It's out of there. Okay. So the, the brown dwarf coming in is hungry for energy. So basically our sun is getting hotter. It's turning white. It's getting bright. Um, we're getting extra solar radiation. That's why we're seeing high UVA, high UVB, high UVC, increased uh, temperatures in the water. Because this brown dwarf is tr basically trying to pull the electromagnetic charge from the sun to feed the, the way that it wants to energize and, and burst into life again. It's not going to, I don't, well, never say never, but I just, I don't even think that's a remote possibility. So, I just, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. But it is hungry for that energy, and that's why we're seeing the sun do that, you know, get super hot during the day and all those other things I mentioned before, okay? Well, the brown dwarf comes in, and then it's gonna go back out just like a, a satellite would do if it was to whip around the moon. But what that's going to do, and why I think this brown dwarf star is there, is because an object in motion is gonna stay in motion with nothing to um, change the direction of its motion. It's gonna stay in the same path. So, if it was just, if it wasn't a binary star system, the sun would just continue to head in the same direction forever, and we would basically be in the same celestial house. Um, we wouldn't be moving through a procession that we repeat. So I guess this takes us on to um, figure two. So the, the procession is achieved um, by this binary counterforce, because it basically, uh, comes around and kind of makes a slight adjustment to the direction of the sun because they're working in tandem kind of like a uh, links on a chain kind of leapfrogging throwing each other through space and the brown dwarf because it has a different angle of momentum sh will change the direction of the solar system so we'll move around a center point and through the celestial houses which um, basically is the definition of an age um, is the passing from one um, celestial house to another and then you have the full procession of the Sun and its binary twin so this right here would be um, this big orange dot would be the Sun this would be the um, nemesis system, the counterforce system. Um, this little uh, pink would, would represent the planets or our solar system that's trailing the sun. Now, most definitely there are exoplanets out there that are probably following this brown dwarf. And even though a brown dwarf does emit solar radiation, it is possible to have I believe it is totally possible to have life on those exoplanets um, near that binary star. And I think it's fair to say that humans have lived on this planet much longer than we're told. And in past ages, um, the ancients understood uh, the procession and knew that uh, every 3,600 years, um, this brown dwarf star is going to whip around and, and cause major changes and it's time to go underground, stay out of the sun. Um, you know, the, the flood of, of Noah, you know. Um, I mean, these cataclysms are recorded over and over and over again. The death of the dinosaurs being like that. Everybody says, oh, well, it's a meteor strike that did it. But I don't think there's enough evidence to support that because, we're, well, they're not buried in ash. You know, they're not. Um, it's like some of them, um, some of the, the fossilized remains uh, give us some indication that, that they breathed in maybe like a volcanic glass from, from these eruptions because this extra uh, energy coming off the sun and the, the, mag the magnetosphere in flux because the brown dwarf system is not only hungry for the, the magnetic energy of the sun, 
it's hungry for the magnetic energy of the Earth, which wants to pull the magnetosphere away from the Earth, which allows more of that uh, solar radiation to come in and from both sides. You've got uh, solar radiation coming off of the brown dwarf and you've got solar radiation coming off of the sun, which is more intense because the brown dwarf is, is wanting to pull that energy toward it. So the earth is getting hit from both sides, which as I demonstrated in um, a, a previous model um, about, you know, kind of the earth maybe being like a lava lamp, um, that solar energy coming in and heating it, um, the, the, the magnetic properties of the, the, um, the, the mantle of the earth is basically what's charging it and giving its, um, giving earth its spin or rotation. And I think, um, you know, this is just a bit more speculation on my part, but I believe that, um, there are periods in history where the earth has stopped spinning and then started to spin in the opposite direction because once once this brown dwarf moves out and it it'll rock it out real quick it's the movement out that would be i think probably the uh real like the real clincher um <laughs> as far as like how things are going to change because you can end up with with stuff like you know uh, maybe only 160 days to a um, cycle around the sun. So the Earth is going around the sun. Right now we call it 365 days because we basically have, you know, 24 and a quarter hours um, in a day, thereabouts. And, um, well, if, if the Earth's spinning, um, if the rotation of the Earth is slower then the day is going to be longer. You could have, let's say, maybe perhaps a 72-hour day and a 72-hour night and have uh, 160 days in the... Um, maybe you could have my math. Yeah, no, third. Yeah, you'd, um, you, you'd have to have my math on, on that. Um, but as the Earth goes around, uh, uh, around the sun, so I hope I'm being clear here. Um, it's kind of difficult to explain because um, you've got the the spin of the earth which which the rotation of the earth which is the length of the day the length of the night and then the time that the earth moves around the sun gives you the year so if the earth is rotating slowly then you're still going around the sun at the same speed but your days are going to be longer and your nights are going to be longer. So, so that, that, that makes sense. So if you went back and you know, analyzed some of the Mayan uh, math, you could say, oh, well, it's, you know, we made some incorrect assumptions about time because time is not a fixed reference. Time is uh, really only important to the observer. So you can't really use time as a marker because what constituted uh, a day for them and the division thereof is is probably different than than ours based on the speed of the rotation of the earth so and then with this um brown dwarf making those adjustments it's going to take the sun and and like i say move our solar system through the houses in the celestial procession. So I think if we could uh, calculate the mass of the sun and we had a relative uh, calculation of the mass of, of the um, brown dwarf, we could probably calculate um, where the center point was. And I speculate, uh, it's a reasoned speculation that it's not quite a sphere that we're moving around this center point. I'm talking about the binary system. I would imagine that because one mass is greater than the other, it's going to kind of be like a um, like a, a weighted barbell. Like if you had a, a, bar, a bar a bar with 
a heavy weight on one end and a lighter weight on the other, and you threw it and it was in a, a weightless condition, it's that, it's that kind of movement that takes the whole uh, bubble, if you will, of um, the travel of our binary system through um, the space in the galaxy. So for the moment, for the moment, that's, that's the best explanation I have for um, what I see going on. You know, it explains the chemtrails, it explains the deep underground bases, it explains, um, uh, you know, the hidden history. It explains why, you know, they've got that uh, major blackout type area, you know, that satellites can't look at in Antarctica. They say, oh, it's the, you know, because it's a pole or whatever there. No, I suspect that the ancients uh, built massive underground complexes. And, and there, there probably are groups of humans that have um, survived these uh, cataclysms and they emerge after the cataclysms and rebuild society and they probably take the best and, and brightest and then protect them through the cataclysms and and then uh, come back and do what they can to re rebuild the world and then humanity repopulates and we go on through space so um, yeah, it's, it's about the best theory I have right now and so I guess some uh, thoughts it's been Hank catch you on the flip side